Hey everybody, it's it's Dave. We uh, had some office hours uh, here on a, on a Sunday morning. Had a couple people show up. I think that might be it. Um, but uh, since I'm gonna be uh, around for a little while longer, I figure I should use the time to do something uh, productive. And uh, so I was looking at the schedule for this week. And uh, oh, and, and by the way, it's it's Dave in weekend mode. He's like somebody's dad, hanging around the house, doing chores, wearing his orange hoodie from work. So I'll go off camera here shortly because you don't need to be looking at this any longer. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, and so I uh, uh, I was thinking about class uh, this week and the fact that like last week was so disruptive, and we're kind of in a in a funny situation. And so then um, I I want to make sure that we have ample time on Wednesday to. Uh, work with test driven development i have some exercises um and uh and and you know after the the crazy weekend i'm sure everybody's catching up uh and everything um i want to make sure that we're making the best use of our time together possible and when i looked at what else is on the agenda for for wednesday um there's a, a lot of uh things i'm going to basically just tell you about like uh, these handouts for how to test your project document your project submitting a project and then we're gonna get two more assignments and um, I, you know it might not be very it, it might be I thought hey, it'd be more effective to uh, pre-record this stuff now so that anybody who wants to watch it before Wednesday can or if we find ourselves on Wednesday you know hey maybe we've done a bunch of test driven development our brains are kind of fried you know give us the option to uh, end it um, a little bit early, or if it takes a long time, just you know, sort of say, um, go watch it on your own. Um, and then, of course, we can follow up with any questions that you might have um, on Slack, or you know, depending on what we do in class. But anyway, uh, since I had a few minutes, I figured that I will um, cover this stuff now. So uh, stop my video. You don't need to be seeing any of that. Um, and let's dive into it. So uh, you know, we've uh, hopefully everybody has been working on the Cohen's project. Um, and uh, we talked about project one uh, on the, the first day of class, but there were some things that were mentioned in the assignment that I said, hey, we'll get to that later. And well, let's get to that now. So uh, the first thing is about testing your project. So here there is a handout about um, about testing. So, you know, as we'll, we'll talk about on, on Wednesday, and you've probably already figured out, um, the testing software is a big part of this course. Uh, it, you know, <laughs> It, as as a professional developer, you want to make sure that your code is as awesome as it can be. Um, and so then uh, the, the the best way to do that is to test it. And uh, you know, well, while there are usually other people uh, that will be you know validating your code, whether it's somebody on your team who is focused on on testing a specialized QA engineer or something like that, and certainly your users will be testing it. Um, it really uh, behooves you to do testing uh, during development so that you can uh, oh so so that your you understand the the quality of your work. You can verify that things are working the way they should. Um, and by by doing it ahead of time, it uh, avoids some of these pitfalls that that I, that I call out here in the handout. So, you know, when when you separate the, the the job of writing code from testing the code, you end up with these really long feedback loops where you where you learn that there's something wrong with your code um, days, weeks, months. Um, long after you have written that code. And it just makes it more and more difficult when you have to fix a bug to understand, you know, where where in the code should it be fixed? Um, why is the current logic um, the way that it is? Uh, you know, what, what's correct, what's incorrect? Um, also, uh, you know, things that were observed is that uh, when, when there's this long feedback loop, there tend to not to be agreement on what the expected behavior is. So, you know, I, I know I've been in situations where one person says, well, you know, that I, I wrote a bunch of code. I thought, you know, I did the way I thought it should work, uh, or rather I provided the functionality that I thought should be provided. And then people are like, well, no, that's not what I think. And so it, was, it just wasn't clear on what the expectations were. Um, also, uh, by by waiting to, to test it until long after it's been developed, um, some people think it's done. It's like, great, I wrote the code, I can move on to something else. And it's like, well, wait, it hasn't. Does it really work? Does it really provide the capabilities that people want? 
Um, and then also it, uh, you know, all too often created this sort of two-tiered system where you had the people that write the code and, oh, like they're important. And then the people who tested the code, well, they're sort of an afterthought and boy, and all they do is just generate more work and, oh, do we really need them? It's like, yes, you do. You need that quality. That's all, that's what we're all here to do is to provide an awesome experience for our users. Um, and uh, just by separating out development and testing, uh, it just, you know, it, it was suboptimal. Time was wasted and um, it often resulted in overall lower quality work. So, you know, things have evolved um, since then. And now, uh, you know, testing is considered a first class citizen in, in product development. Um, and it also helped that, uh, you know, unit testing became a thing and there were these really easy to use frameworks like JUnit, like, you know, you've learned about and have been experiencing. Um, and uh, then also, uh, you know, the codification of test-driven development, um, as we'll, you know, we'll see in class. Th this has really made it so that uh, testing is just part of developing software. So it takes it back to this course. So I'd like you to experience writing tests for your software because um, it's a really important part of contemporary software development. So here in the class, um, you're required to write passing tests for your projects and they are submitted along with your application code. Um, these tests and the passing of these tests, um, well, not only passing of them, but also the, um, the, the, the amount of code coverage they provide is part of your grade. And I do this um, by using a tool called Jococo for Java code coverage. Um, that uh, when you run um, the, uh, the the Maven wrapper, the Maven W command, um, with the dash p greater, which enables the greater profiler, your unit tests and your integration tests run with code coverage. And what this basically does is it um, it measures uh, which lines of code or which actually instructions, um, the level instructions are uh, are are covered by tests and therefore identifies which uh, instructions, which lines of code are not covered by the tests. And um, as I talk about, there will be a, uh, well, I guess I'm gonna talk about it now. Um, there, uh, the, the requirement is, is that at least 75% of the JVM instructions in your project are executed by the unit integration tests. And if uh, there isn't uh, sufficient coverage demonstrated, then uh, you can lose up to you know, one point from your, for your project grade. So basically one of the test cases that I put your code through is an assessment of uh, how much coverage there has been of the, uh, you know, of the code by the, uh, by the automated tests. Jococo is a really cool uh, utility and it generates some nice reports and things like that. And so then if you, uh, when you run with a dash P greater, um, you'll see that there are uh, files created in target site Jococo um, for the unit tests and then a Jococo IT for the integration test directory for the integration tests that um, let you ident that easily identify what code has and has not been covered by the tests. Um, so that, those are the expectations for writing unit and integration tests. Uh, for the, the class. Um, there's a couple of, of notes here about Jococo. Um, the way it works is pretty cool. It actually modifies the, the bytecode that's generated for, um, from, the, from the source code, the class files, uh, to then track uh, what lines of code have and have not been covered. Um, but this is sort of a post-processing step. And uh, if you don't necessarily, if things aren't cleaned up afterwards or sometimes things get into a little funky state. So if you see errors like, you know, test engine with ID, JUnit Jupyter failed to discover tests, um, things like that. Uh, it probably means that IntelliJ tried to run. So if you're running a test from IntelliJ, uh, uh, it probably means that IntelliJ tried to run a test that had already been augmented with uh, Jococo and that completely confused it. So if you find yourself uh, encountering these errors, uh, you can uh, just run a mavenw clean from the command line environment or maybe rebuild project from the build menu in IntelliJ. That uh, experience shows that that cleans everything up. And so then when you run again, um, the uh, run things again from IntelliJ, uh, Jococo will be part of the picture. So let's see here. I think, oh, there is more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so then uh, some other th other things to note uh, that 
and I think I alluded to this in project one, but something I just want to emphasize here, that if your unit test or integration tests end up calling system.exit either directly or more likely if you know you invoke your main method and call system.exit, um, this will terminate the test JVM. And this, uh, you know, the harness that runs the, the tests will get confused because it, it will have exited unexpectedly. Um, so uh, please don't, uh, call system.exit. It's not a requirement for the project. As a matter of fact, it'll most likely just get you into trouble with your unit tests. So, you know, I know that's something that, uh, you know, when writing command line programs is customary and yeah, not for this course, you've probably experienced it in other courses. So uh, if, if you end up seeing messages um, in, in IntelliJ, like process finished with exit code, or, you know, that message from Maven, it's um, likely a sign that your a test code has invoked um, system.exit. Because uh, again, it confuses the uh, the test runners, the test harnesses. So hopefully you're able to take the uh, everything that you learned about uh, in class tonight about test driven development and begin applying that to your uh, tests, writing unit tests and integration tests for your uh, for your project one. Let me know if you have any questions about the uh, the testing requirements. Okay, another handout uh, that we have is how to document your projects. So uh, you might have seen this, oops, there we go. In uh, maybe some of the slides, I can't remember if we talked about, uh, talked about it in, in class um, on the first day. Um, but there's definitely some things here that uh, I'd like you to know about the requirements and just good practices for documenting the code that you write for this course. Um, and, and, and you know, when I say documentation, it's it's more than documentation. It's being able to communicate effectively about your code, what it does, how it does it. You know, the intent that you have when you when you write your code. And um, you know, documentation and having um, a clear expressions of of what you what you have done uh, and or what you plan to do helps. Uh, helps you write code better because you have that clarity and also helps others consume your code uh, more easily. And uh, so then this is just, you know, yet another part of uh, just like, you know, having good variable names and having a uh, well-factored code following good design patterns. It, it just makes the code that you write easier to maintain, extend, and, and reuse. So uh, there are a couple of mechanisms that we use in this course to document uh, our, our code. Um, the first is something called a plan of attack. So this is uh, this is a, a brief document that that you write and then email to me, um, preferably just as plain text in the in the body of an email. Please don't attach a PDF or anything like that. It's it's just a couple of paragraphs, right? Don't need diagrams. Shouldn't be anything fancy. And the whole idea is that this is a concise design document that explains how you'll implement the project. You don't need to tell me the requirements. I know the requirements. I wrote them. Um, but uh, this is, you know, basically an explanation of, of, of how you, uh, you're, you're going to implement your project. The, the plan of attack, the POA, is worth one point of your project grade. So I think, you know, we see in the assignments, there's a little footnote saying that, yep, you know, one of the points is for the POA. This is why. Oh, looks like someone's entering office hours. I'm going to pause the recording and, um, and go with that. Okay, I'm back. Um, so again, we were talking about the plan of attack. Again, this is a, a concise uh, design document, a couple of paragraphs, not code, please no diagrams, um, that is emailed uh, to me in uh, just as plain text. So uh, POAs count as part of one point of your project grade and are due uh, 72 hours, so three days before the project is due. So projects are due on Wednesday evening at 5.30, right before class. And so that means the POAs are due on Sunday evening. Um, and uh, they're, if you don't get late credit for POAs, uh, even the project's going to be late, please get the POA on time. So email it to me at uh, whitlock at cs.pdx.edu, and please include the letters POA in the, uh, and the name of the project in the subject, because I have a, a filter that gets all these into uh, their own folder, and uh, that let, lets me uh, better focus on the other emails that, that you send. 
So also, I guess it means that if you have an email for me that's urgent or something that you want me to know, that's uh, that you're going to email to me. Please don't put POA in in the subject. Now, the you know the, the reason behind the the plan of attack is to yeah give you an opportunity to uh, you know learn how to effectively communicate. Uh, that what you're we're going to be doing in your projects, but also it it forces you to think and to write some stuff down um, about about the project before doing it. So you really can't start at the last minute um, because you need to start the uh, the POA you know on on Sunday sometime. So uh, a little uh, ha method to my madness. So that's what the plan of attack is. Um, also, uh, another part of what you'll be documenting or how you'll document your projects in in this class is by using Javadoc. Now, we uh, I think we might have looked at this a, a little bit. If not, I can show it off in class. Uh, but um, you know, there's documentation that lives outside of your code, but there's also documentation that lives with your code. Now, probably you know. Arguably, the, the 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 best form of documentation is just well written code, um, method and variable names that make sense, code that is well structured, um, and so it's easy to understand not only the structure and implementation of the code but also the intent um, behind it. But uh, there's another um, feature of the Java programming language that I'd like you to um, to, to learn how to use. And that's called JavaDoc, and what uh, uh, what what you know what JavaDoc does is it describes various program elements. These are special comments that perceive program elements like uh, classes, class declarations, and field declarations, and method declarations uh, that describe that uh, that a class, that method, that uh, whatever. And um, so then uh, you know you've seen it in the code. Probably it's the comments that begin with slash star star and end with the star slash. Um, and in between, and what, what those Javadoc comments um, are signals of are, uh, again, descriptions of the program elements. And there's a tool called Javadoc that will analyze the source code and extract the documentation from those comments and, um, uh, and, and then generate, uh, you know, pretty HTML documentation uh, for them, complete with links and formatting and bolding and, and things like that. Um, so then I want you to experience this. There's a lot more uh, information about Javadoc here at, uh, at this link. And uh, so when I grade your projects, um, I will uh, run the uh, mavenw command dash p grader. So that's the, the grader profiler, grader profile. Um, again, I'll say javadoc colon javadoc, and what that will do is it will uh, run the javadoc tool and then output a, uh, well, a, a, a javadoc as text, so it's easy for me to grade and, and, and see it. Um, and uh, then I will review the javadoc for completeness, um, make sure that every, um, I think I have it down here, what is it? Uh, let's see here, I guess basically every, Oh yeah, every class and every method that you write, so not my classes, not my stuff, but like things that you write, um, ought to have a uh, Java.com that describes what it does. And um, I, you know, I encourage and actually I require you to use um, uh, the at param, the at return, and at throws tags um, for, you know, for for the methods and stuff that uh, that, that you Java doc. Um, let's see here. Also. Uh, so and and oh yeah and uh, again one of the test cases so you know if you don't have any Java doc um, you know I'll deduct like up to one point from the uh, from the assignment so this is you know again all part of the software yes the most important thing is to get the software working so that it solves the problem that our users want to solve um, but it's also important that the code be well documented and that the the APIs that you write um, are understandable by others. Um, additionally, I encourage you to check up, check out the uh, the style guide, um, which is sort of this style guide from um, from Google, which provides. Uh, just make sure that's still yeah, still there. Which um, provides uh, just a lot of good um, uh, a, a lot of good information about um, how to uh, how to write Java code in in general. Oh, someone else just showed up for uh, office hours. I will be right back. So then the style guide is uh, a, a good way to learn how to structure your code in a canonical way that will be familiar to uh, other Java programmers and will help you then be able to understand and, um, and, and, and read Java code um, more effectively.
I, I don't enforce anything about the the, the Java style, um, but it's something that I do recommend that you uh, that you check out. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so that was the uh, the Java doc comments. So POA do uh, three days before the project. The Java doc comments there in your code, and then the last way that we uh, document our our code is the is the README. So, uh, you know, the, the README is I don't know it's kind of the other end of the POA where the POA is a design document you write before the program. The README says what the program does and maybe how it does it. Um, uh, after the program has been written, and uh, this is you know this is to give you an opportunity to uh, learn how to effectively express the functionality of your software in words. So every project, every command line project has a dash readme switch, which should print a brief, concise, and nicely formatted description of what your project does. So make sure that your readme includes your name and the name of the assignment. So like you know. Your given name and the name of the assignment um, and it should be more than just command line usage it's fine to include the command line usage but also uh, it you know should have I don't know a sentence or two about what the uh, what the project does uh, note that when dash readme is specified on the command line the program shouldn't do any other um, really any other work especially error checking so you know it's okay to just say you know to invoke your program with just the dash readme argument that is valid because all it'll see uh, readme and immediately put the readme and exit um now uh you know the readme is a big chunk of text putting a big chunk of text inside source code is ugly um and uh so um if you look at the the project that is created when you run the create first project script you'll see that there is a, a file um, off in the resources directory um, called readme.txt and if you look at the project one test uh, unit test you'll see some code that will uh, read that uh, will read that readme.txt file as a resource um, and let's see here i think the resource api is covered in one of the lectures anyway um, and uh, and then um, and and then include it and, and then it'll it'll read it in so that you can you know print it out later. Um, note that uh, because of the way that I build the project, uh, please don't use the file API to uh, to, to read the the, the resource. Um, well, read the read the readme.txt. Um, use the resource API, and uh, that way it'll it'll work no matter uh, where the resource ends up. Um, well, that way it'll always read it out of the jar file that's built and not on some location in disk. Um, this is something that other students have done in the past and they've you know, uh, uh, run into problems and lost points because their readme didn't work. Nice, okay. And so uh, that's what I wanted to uh, tell you about how to document your projects. You've got the readme, you've got the uh, Java doc, and you've got the plan of attack. Let me know if you have any questions about that. Okay, so we've been talking about projects. We talked about uh, you know how to test them. We talked about how to document them. Let's talk about how to submit them. <laughs> that would be something uh, important. And there's not a handout for that. Um, I have all of those details in the getting started project in the getting started uh, repository. So here in the README, there is a how do I submit my projects section. So I know we don't have you know tremendous number of students uh, this term, but um, one of the things I've discovered over the years, uh, especially when this course was a lot popular when we had as many as 60 at one point, um, was that there are certain things that uh, I find to be toilsome and things I want to automate to make easier, right? I'm a you know, software developers here. What do we do? We automate processes to, to make them faster, to make them easier. And uh, so I want to be able to focus you know, my time with you all on things that I think are very valuable, like having office hours, like interacting um, and answering your questions and providing you feedback on the quizzes and the, the, the projects. I don't want to spend a lot of time you know, copying files from one location to another, or having to click around a bunch of emails to extract attachments and stuff like that. I want that all to be automated so that all that happens in seconds and not minutes. So um, 
I've uh, over the years developed a uh, a little tool that's actually a Java program. You can go look at the source code if you want um, to uh, submit the projects. And this is a tool that uh, is run on the uh, the PSU Linux machines, and those are also the machines that I grade your projects on. So I want to make sure that you can um, run them and submit them from uh, from the PSU machines. So uh, when you're ready to submit your project, you run a script called submit.sh, which was uh, here in the Getting Started repository. And, uh, and so the note that this is not, you know, you don't submit it through Canvas, you don't send me an email, you know, you don't give me a floppy disk, right? <laughs> Things like that. Um, it's like you run the submit script. And what it does is uh, this will do a little bit of validation of your, your program before you submit, just things we don't want to fail right out of the gate, right? So a little bit of uh, va validation there. Um, and then it zips up the, the source code and sends it to the grader, the grader's account, um, which I have access to. So what it does is it uh, first builds the project using the maven-d grader, um, oh, should be probably dash p grader, but anyway, um, clean verify. Um, and that's just to make sure that everything compiles, that all of your, your tests succeed, um, and that you've got sufficient code coverage. Um, you know, those are things that I want to make sure we validate before or as part of the submission process, just so that there aren't any surprises on your part to find out that, oh, wow, look, I submitted a bunch of code that doesn't compile as the, as the grader, and I'm grading this term. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't have to send you, you know, your, 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 if the feedback of like, oops, you submitted something that doesn't compile. So um, it, uh, it, it, it does that. Um, and, and note that, uh, you know, I, I can't commit. As a matter of fact, I'm probably not going to try. Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll try a little bit to debug, debug, debug your code, but you can't rely on the grader to, you know, figure out that, oh, look, you know, I've got a syntax error. I'm going to correct it. Nope, I will tell you the syntax error and, and move on. Um, oh, there's a couple of notes about submitting. Um, please, uh, if you've added, you know, debugging output or, or a bunch of you know, print lines or something like that, um, but please take them out before you submit it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, all, there's uh, the, the, the UI is text-based, and when there's a whole bunch of debugging text uh, in amongst the things that um, I'm looking for, like, you know, the description of the appointment that was just added, uh, that just clutters things up. So please, um, uh, that makes the job of the grader uh, more difficult. Remember, I'm the grader <laughs> this this term. Um, and uh, oh, also, you know, if there is a bit of back and forth or grader, um, I'm going to uh, encourage you to hey, if there's something that doesn't work or something that's failing, hey, let's say that you know uh, you're not you're the, the program doesn't uh, validate the, uh, the the date. Um, you know, correctly or something. I'm going to encourage you to write unit tests. Uh, that's you know one of the things about test driven development that I really like. Uh, the first thing you know whenever I find a bug, the first thing I do is I write a test that uh, verifies it, or sorry, a test that reproduces it. Um, and then uh, you know my job as the developer is to get that test passing again by fixing the the bug in the code. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Okay, so here's how you use the submit script. It takes one argument, which is the name of the project uh, to submit. And um, it also, when you create your project five, uh, you'll get be you'll be in a different source code directory, but the, the submit script is smart enough to know about that. So you can um, submit project one just by running submit.sh capital P project one, and uh, you run this from the top level of the uh, of your Git repository. Um, and what that'll do is it'll run the submit program after um, after doing the the Maven clean verify. It will list all the, pro the files that you're about to submit and prompt you uh, to confirm that, yes, these are the files you want to submit. Um, and then it also asks you a question. So uh, well, I'll go on to, I'll say, say, what, well, I'll say how it's used uh, in, in a little bit. But it's going to ask you to provide sort of a rough estimate of the number of hours that you spent working on the project. Um, this is, is optional. You don't need to put it. It will not count towards your grade. Um, and the only way that is used is that I, I've been recording. I've been um, capturing this information for a couple of years now um, to uh, to give you all an idea of hey, how have past students, how long have past students reported that they've uh, they've taken? And I'll show you that data here um, shortly. So after you enter that, um, it sits there and uh, creates a zip file and emails it to the grader. Sometimes it takes a minute or two um, just to you know contact the uh, the, the mail server, um, if you will. And you'll also receive a an email receipt saying uh, which files were sent to the grader. So that's that's the submitting process. Um, 
again, you know, what this does is does a little bit of validation before submitting um, and also uh, make sure that everything is submitted in a consistent way so that I can, uh, so that my, my tools, the automated process that I've developed um, can easily extract the code so that it can be graded you know, quickly and efficiently. Again, so that I, and when there are graders, you know, we can all spend our time focusing on providing good feedback to you and not just a bunch of overhead of moving files around and trying to, you know, extract uh, stuff in different ways. Other things I wanted to mention, um, you can only submit source files, so you can't submit you know, class files or, you know, any other binaries or things like that. So specifically .java, .xml, and .txt files um, in the source directory are, uh, are, are submitted. And so that's why uh, if you're going to have a, a readme uh, in a text file, it needs to be in source main resources. Um, and uh, the palm.xml file um, cannot be, will not be submitted. Um, and th this, I do this on purpose um, because um, I don't want you to add uh, dependencies. So like, you know, a third party library that does command line parsing um, like that. Uh, um, it's not something that I want you to do. I want you to write your own tools for a command line parsing. That's all part of the course. Note that uh, it's probably fine to uh, submit multiple times, but I'm only going to grade your most recent uh, submission. Uh, but, um, you know, please do be aware that you know, there's a little bit of overhead in uh, dealing with multiple submissions and stuff. So, uh, you know, please make sure that, uh, you know, your, your code is working before you submit. This is why we write tests, right? And note that uh, the submission process records a timestamp at which the submission was made. This is how I know whether or not projects um, are, are late. And as you may recall from the first day, you know, what the, the, the policies are for, for late work. Um, but, you know, this is, how, this is how we know. A couple more things on, uh, on submitting. So let's see here. Um, the submit script also has an optional second argument, which is, uh, which, which is a comment that provides some background information. Nope. Oh. Office hours can back up again. I will uh, pause here. Be right back. So yeah, so the project, so the submit script um, has a second argument, which is just a comment that you can leave that will be included with your submission. If there's anything that you wanted me to know, like you know, hey, you know, there's some functionality that I couldn't get working, or, or or just whatever. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, one other thing that the submit script does is that it creates uh, what's called a tag in the uh, the Git repository. I I mentioned it in the uh, in the lecture, um, and uh, what what this does is it basically just records the submission in uh, in GitHub. And uh, so, for instance, uh, you know if you uh, submit it on uh, you know May first at 9 a.m. Uh, for Project One. It'll create a a, a tag called submit dash Project One dash and then a big timestamp. So this, uh, what, what this does is it, uh, if you find, if there's a bug or something you want to go back and fix, this will allow you to very easily find the revision of your code that was submitted. You can go and create a branch for it, and um, then uh, you can go back and fix things, especially if you've already then maybe started the next project or made a bunch of other changes that you don't want to submit uh, again. You can you know, do it that way. Here again, this is just an option. You don't have to, um, but uh, you know, it takes advantage of the of the tagging mechanism, the branching mechanism that Git has. Um, oh, also, uh, if you have uncommitted changes in your repository, so you know you've implemented some stuff and then uh, uh, submitted it before you committed it, um, the submit script will uh, will fail. And so please be sure to commit all of the changes that you've made to your code before submitting. This way, your Git repository has all of the code that was submitted. I've run into problems in the past where students have submitted something that wasn't in their repository, and then they made more changes, and so they didn't have exactly that same code. It was just a mess. So I just added you know, this enforcement mechanism. Um, yeah, yeah, the when creating the tag um, only creates it locally, and so if you want to then uh, put your tags up on uh, GitHub um, so that you have them there, uh, like for instance, you want to you know get that same tag over in your uh, checkout on your development machine, you can push the tags with git push dash dash tags, uh, or just choose an individual tag to uh, to push. 
So anyway, the submit script does a lot of stuff. I just wanted to walk you through all of it. Um, you know, probably the, the thing that you'll just do most often is just say, you know, submit.sh and then project one, submit it that way. Now, I, I mentioned that uh, I've been gathering some data about how long it takes students to complete the projects. Um, and so here's, you know, here is that data. Uh, you know, this is, this is funny, you know, I've, I've had that sub, the submit script for, you know, a number of years. And uh, on the first day of class, I had a student ask, well, about how long should I expect the project to take? Uh, you know, take me. And I'm like, well, I have no idea. I've never done the projects myself and I'm probably not, you know, the, the best person to, to answer that. And I realized that, well, we could gather data um, to, to do that. So I've been doing that for, uh, for a while now. So I think it's, I don't know, three or four offerings of the course where we've had similar projects. So uh, here they are. Um, so then app classes is project one um, this term. So I've had 53 students who have submitted it over the last couple of years. And on average, it took them 61 hours, uh, sorry, 21 hours to, uh, to do it. This is all self-reported. So you know, here again, um, take it as it is. I don't know how accurate it is, although I don't know why anybody would like, you know, potentially mislead us on, on this again whatever value you put there, I don't look at it. <laughs> it doesn't affect your grade or anything. Um, but anyway, so here's some statistics about it. So, you know, on average, it was 21 hours, but, you know, it took between seven hours and 60 hours. So some student took spent 60 hours on it. Um, but, uh, you know, the median is 20 hours, which means, you know, half the students took more than 20 hours, half the students took less. And um, the 25% uh, the of students that did it um, fastest uh, took no more than 13 hours. So uh, anyway, I don't know if this, you know, is helpful. It's data that is out there. Um, but, uh, you know, for your own planning purposes, then also, I guess, to sort of gauge, you know, how you're doing you know, with, against other students. And so, like, you know, if you're like, wow, I only spent four hours on that, uh, you know, on average, it took, you know, 21, yeah, maybe I should put in some more time. <laughs> or, you know, maybe that should be a, a clue that, um, that you know, maybe, yeah, there's some, some more stuff that they might need to do. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, this is how you uh, submit your, your programs. Um, you know, if you need to go back and read over this again, it's all there in the README um, in your repository. Okay, so we talked about uh, how to test your projects, how to document your projects, how to submit your projects. Let's talk about some more projects. So uh, project two. Project two builds on project one um, by storing the contents of an appointment book in a text file. I think a couple of people mentioned to me, it's like, Project one doesn't seem to have a lot of functionality. I mean, we just create some objects and then we exit. And the answer is yes. Yep, you can only, in project one, you can only um, create one uh, appointment, add to appointment book, and, the, and that's it. Project two, you can do something a little bit more interesting. Uh, you'll be able to persist the appointment that you create, the appointment book that you create out to a text file, and then read it back in and add more appointments to it. And, you know, the goal here is to explore Java's facilities for doing I.O. and to handle um, some more uh, complex input and uh, so also throw exceptions there. So uh, you'll take the code from project one. So your appointment book and your appointment um, and then your, your main method and you'll write some more code. <laughs> right, because we do in this class, we write code. So well, one um, piece of code, a class that you will write is a class called text dumper that implements the appointment book dumper interface. An appointment book dumper is basically something that you know takes an appointment book and dumps it, writes it to some destination. Um, and so then it you know writes uh, the you know all, the entire contents of the uh, the appointment book, um, including its appointments, out to a text file. Um, similarly, there is a text parser, which implements the appointment book parser interface that goes the other way, right? It reads the contents of a text file and creates an appointment book object um, with all the information in that, uh, in that file. So these are two new classes that you'll, you'll write and you can have, uh, well, you, you ought to have unit tests uh, for all this stuff, it'll be good. And then finally, there is a, a new main method or a new main class um, called project two which uh you know takes uh w which augments well which adds some new options actually adds a new option to the command line so what it does is it uh, optionally reads an appointment book um from a text file 
um, just like project one, creates a new appointment, adds that appointment to the appointment book, and then optionally writes the appointment book back to the text file, that same text file. And so the project two command line um, is essentially the same as the project one command line, except uh, that we now have a new option, which is called text file. And this specifies the location from which the appointment book data should be uh, written and, and read. But everything else is the same. You have the arguments that are all required, the owner description, the begin and end times. You still have a dash print, you still have dash readme. Um, and, uh, but now you have the dash text file. <laughs> oh, there's a couple of footnotes here. Don't need to create a new Maven project um, for, uh, for project two. You can use the same one as project one. Because um, the whole goal, goal here is that you take your code base from project one and you evolve it to uh, add these new requirements. Um, you can, uh, let's see here. You don't need to keep your project one class around. You just rename it to project two uh, if you'd like. Um, but when you do, you'll also need to update uh, your pom.xml to refer to project two instead of project one. You can, uh, you can see it there. Oh, and note also that um, the in the appointment book uh, dumper, there's a parameterized type T, which uh, which you can bind to your appointment book implementation to tell it what type of appointment book to uh, uh, to dump, um, and that means that the uh, that that you won't have to do a lot of casting because it knows that it deals with your type of appointment book, not the abstract uh, appointment book. A couple more things for project two that I want you to keep in mind. Um, when you run in your main method, if the text file doesn't exist yet, this is an okay situation. Right? This is how you bootstrap everything. So in that case, just create a new appointment book object and write, uh, you know, add the appointment and write its contents to a file. Please do not issue an error if the text file doesn't exist. Right? I, when I grade it, I don't know what the format of your text file is, and so I can't create one to test it with. Instead, I rely, the pro rely on the program to create it the first time that you run with dash text file. Now note that the argument to the dash text file option can be any valid file path. It could be an absolute path from the root of the file system. It could be relative to the current working directory. Um, it's not always, you know, a file in the current working directory. It can be someplace else. Um, so please do not restrict or try to validate anything or make any assumptions about the text file. Similarly, there are no restrictions on the name of the text file, so it doesn't have to end with .txt or any valid file name on the file system should be allowed. Don't add any extra validation there. And uh, note that dates and times have the same format as they were in the previous assignment. I guess one other thing I want to reiterate is that the format of the text file is completely up to you as part of the assignment, right, is to figure out how to, uh, what, what format you want the text file to be so that you can uh, write it out and read it back in again um, effectively. Um, some additional information about uh, error handling. Um, as always, uh, your program should exit gracefully with a nice error message um, when there are surprises that are encountered, um, things that it doesn't know how to handle. So for instance, you know, it's like it's the command line or too many options on the command line, uh, just like project one, if the uh, format of the day or time is incorrect. Um, new to project two is if your text file is malformatted, right? So if you've got some bad data in there, um, it should uh, an issue uh, an error um, nicely, um, and uh, oh, and here's a, here's a new requirement. Um, it's also an error if the name of the owner that is uh, provided on the command line is different from the one in the, in the text file. And you know there are other ones that um, I'm sure you'll uncover while uh, developing your project and uh, and writing tests for it. One other thing um, that's relevant to project two, you know, um, so project in project two, you'll be using the the file APIs um, uh, and the readers and, and, and the uh, and the readers and writers, those things that you learned about in the I/O lecture, to uh, to work with files. In project one, you worked with a resource, or you, you might, you very likely worked with a resource for your README, and resources are different than files. And so I just wanted to say a few words about those differences, um, uh, because yes, they're similar, and yes, underneath, 
you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, yes, they're both reading from files, but the APIs are different and conceptually they're, they're, they're different. So, um, you know, the command line program uses files, right? Uh, the dashed text file provides the location of a file on disk. The readme, um, I encourage you to read it from a resource. But you'll see some examples in the in the code that was created when you ran the uh, the create project one script that load test text files as resources. So these are these are tests, and this is a very common thing to do in in, in tests, right? You have some canned data that you want to uh, use in a test. So for instance, yeah, you want to you know test that you can properly um, parse in a uh, a text file, or you want to validate that an exception is thrown when a malformatted text file is is read. Um, and a great way to do that is to have the text file stored as a resource that your test code then loads and and works with. And there's an example of that in the um, uh, in in the in the unit tests uh, in the text parser test um, ha has that. So, uh, so that's a you know, place where you can uh, use resources, um, uh, but you cannot use a resource, the resource API for reading the, the text files provided on the command line, right? Because the text file is, you know, is, is a file, can re reside anywhere, um, and, uh, but, but the resources are loaded from inside the jar file um, when, the, when the program is run. Anyway, this is an important note. It's something that um, has tripped up some uh, students in the past and something I just wanted to make you uh, know about. Oh, also an important footnote here. Remember that the submit program only allows .txt files. So even though the, the uh, command line program can uh, support text files uh, with any suffix, um, all of your resources that you use for testing have to end in .txt because those get submitted by the submit program. And of course, if it's something that's using a unit test, you want to have that resource available for your unit test. So anyway, as you can see, a text, as a te uh, test two, uh, project two, build upon project one, um, adds some more functionality, gives you an opportunity to work with Java IO APIs. Um, there is uh, more stuff here. And that is due on February 7th. So I think that's three weeks. Um, that you have to to do this again. Everything got pushed out because of the uh, of the crazy weather. Um, I encourage you to start this as as soon as possible. Um, uh, but uh, you know, please make sure that project one one is well underway and that you've uh, you know you've invested appropriately in project one before breaking ground on project two. Especially since it's the same code, you'll be modifying things and stuff. Oh, and sorry, there's one more thing. I guess to be clear, um, because text file is an option. You don't have to specify it. And if you don't specify it, you get exactly the same behavior as project one, meaning that you know a new appointment book is created, you add the appointment, maybe print it out of dash prints there, and that's it. Right? The whole idea is that the second uh, the second project builds upon the first project, and so then the test cases for the first project are still valid. Okay, so that was project two. Let's talk about project three. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm assigning this tonight uh, because it was originally supposed to be assigned, and I think I kind of want to get everything out out there um, for people to start working on, um, especially if you've been keeping up with the the lectures, and I hope you have. Um, you've already seen the content uh, about working with collections and working with um, dates and text formatting, um, and so then uh, here's how you're going to apply that in Project Three. Um, it seems helpful. You'll be starting Project Three this week. Hey, maybe if you're like you know super ahead and you weren't disrupted by last week, all the more power to you. That's great. Um, I'm jealous. <laughs> I was disrupted last week, um, but uh, uh, but you know, go ahead and get started. Um, uh, that'll be uh, you know that'll be good. So, project three. Um, okay, project three continues uh, building out our appointment book application, and um, it uh, it pretty prints it. 
So the, you, you're going to continue to add more capabilities to your appointment book application. Um, and these capabilities will give you an opportunity to explore Java's facilities for working with dates, for sorting objects, and for formatting uh, formatting text in a human readable way, right? In project two, you saw how to format text that can be read by a machine, which is important, which is good. But now here in project three, you're gonna be formatting text that's that can be easily read by a human. So um, some uh, new requirements for, for this project. You're gonna be making a change to your appointment class. Um, or what is likely a change to your appointment class, right? We, you know, wrote this project, uh, we wrote this class for project one. And here we are in project three, um, augmenting it a little bit. So as you may recall, there are these two methods called get begin time and get end time. And I said for project one, yeah, hey, don't worry about those because both of them uh, return. Oh, actually, you know what? It's not a job utility date anymore. I believe it is a zoned date time. Uh, sorry about that. I will fix that here in the assignment. So uh, begin and end times are now uh, zoned date times, and so you can you know hopefully learn about those in the uh, in the lectures. And uh, now I want you to uh, yep I want you to override the get begin time methods uh, get get begin time and get end time methods to use the uh, to, to to you know store and return uh, those those date objects those zoned date time objects, and also uh, I'd like you to modify the get begin time string and get end time string methods to return strings that format those dates using, well, it'll be date time formatter, um, about short. Again, I'll, I'll fix it in the assignment. Um, and, and this is the first time I'm using those newer uh, date APIs, and I just forgot, to, uh, 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 just forgot to update the assignment, I guess. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, dates are now represented as objects instead of strings, which is cool. Also, um, the, the, the appointments inside an appointment book um, should now be sorted. So in the, uh, in the collections lecture, you learned about how to sort objects um, using the comparable interface. And now you're gonna apply that here in project three. So if two appointments begin at the same time, they should be sorted chronologically by their end times, right? Um, and then otherwise, uh, they're sorted lexicographically, alphabetically by their, by their descriptions. So those are the rules for sorting. And probably the easiest way to implement this is to have your um, appointment class now implement the comparable interface so it knows how to compare itself to another instance of appointment. So dates are objects, appointments are sorted, and now uh, you're gonna use those in a new implementation of the appointment book dumper interface called Pretty Printer. So recall what appointment book dumper does, it just takes an appointment and writes it to some destination in some format. Well, now the format is going to be a pretty format. That's what the Pretty Printer does. So what it does is it uh, creates text representation of an appointment book that is readable by a human. Right? It should be nicely formatted, be something that you or I could look at and make sense of. Um, you know, I, uh, this is an opportunity to work more with the daytime formatter uh, API, so please use that. And uh, in addition to formatting dates nicely uh, and other information about the, uh, the appointment, um, it should also include the duration of each appointment in minutes. So figuring out how to do that is also part of the assignment. All of these, this new functionality is made available to the user via the main method of a project three class, which augments the command line interface from project two um, with a uh, new argument called, oops, sorry, a new argument called dash pretty. So this specifies the uh, destination to write the pretty version of the, of the, uh, of the appointment book. So uh, the file is, uh, the, sorry, the dash pretty option takes a file um, and that file is, uh, again, any file in the file system. Or if the file is the character dash, so if the user provides dash pretty space dash, then the pretty content should be written to standard output. And uh, 
depending, you know, it, there's actually a easy, nice, easy way to uh, implement this if you've abstracted out the destination to where you are, where your pretty printer writes stuff. Um, that's also part of the assignment is to figure out how best to structure your code to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, accommodate both writing to a file and writing to standard output. Um, let's see here, some other notes. Oh, note that the pretty printing should happen after the new appointment has been added. Recall, every time you run this program, it adds a new appointment. That is still the case. And so then, uh, you know, the program should optionally read the appointment book from the text file, add the new appointment, and then uh, print it out if dash pretty is specified. And by the way, this prints out the entire appointment book, which is different from dash print, which just prints the latest appointment that was uh, or the newly added appointment. Another uh, another important change is that the 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 format of the date and time um, has has changed. So it's no longer 24 hour time and it's got a time zone ID. So uh, an example of a valid date time is something like the following, uh, you know, zero, uh, 0102, 2023 at uh, 916 p.m. in America, Los Angeles time. So uh, this is just more rich uh, time formatting um, stuff that you get to uh, get to work with and, uh, and, and experience. Yep. Oh, yeah. Here's where we use the date, date time formatter. Yeah, I fixed some of the references, but not all of them. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see here. Um, so that's all the capabilities that uh, are for project three. Just a couple notes on error handling. Um, you know, as usual, you should have a nice graceful error message uh, when there's something missing from the command line or when the format of the day or time is incorrect. Um, or here's a new one. If the appointment's end time is before it's begin time. All right, so now you, I think someone asked about this for project one. Hey, do we need to check to make sure if the end time is before the, uh, the sorry, if the end time is always after the begin time? Yes, you need to check for that now in project three. And uh, the date objects, the its own date time objects that you, uh, that you use to represent dates should make this really easy. Okay. So that is project three. Um, let me know if you have uh, any questions there. And this is due on February 21st. So uh, you've got a, a while to do this one by one to give you a heads up on it now, um, just so that you, know, you can sort of get a better understanding for what else is coming in the course. And that's everything that I wanted to cover. And I know that's a lot. And actually, I'm really curious to see how long this video was because, you know, we might not have time or might not have the energy on, on Wednesday to dive into all these details. Plus, I want to give people a heads up on it now. And, you know, I had some time during these office hours. So I hope that this, um, this screencast was helpful to you um, and gives you a better idea of what the expectations are for Project One so that you can, uh, you know, after we've seen test driven development writing unit tests, you can really dive into that and drive that to completion and then um, feel that you've got good momentum and have a good strategy for the expectations for Project Two and Project Three. Hope everybody's staying safe and, and warm. Um, hope everybody's power's back and can sort of have a normal week. Um, I look forward to seeing you all on, on Wednesday night. And as always, I really appreciate you taking contemporary software development here at Portland State University. Um, got off to a kind of a crazy start, but I'm looking forward to being able to, to dive into these, um, these topics with you and see, how, uh, see what you think, see how learning goes. Okay, I'll see everybody later. Bye now.